Let's get started. J.C. Sherbert. Woo! 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 Gamecock fans, welcome home. See how it goes. Uh, but we'll be ready to go. It's time to root. Let's go, Carolina. It's gone. Touchdown. What a hit. He makes it in. Can you believe it? The Cops have won this game. Here are your hosts, J.C. Sherbert. I'll watch him celebrate now. Bill Molinax. My wife doesn't like hanging around losers. And Jamie Bradford. I'm going to tell you, you look like you joined the dynasty. <laughs> Alright, greetings and good morning and welcome aboard Inside the Game Cox, the show live from the Sinorama Studios and very proudly presented by Express Sunrooms of Columbia. Phil Molinax, JB, here until 1 o'clock this afternoon. JC, once again, is still in Disney World and we hope that he makes it back from there. And if he does, we'll have him back on our program 
on Monday. Between now and then, though, we'll get you ready for this weekend's top 25 matchup at Founders Park between the Gamecocks and the Missouri Tigers. It is hard to believe that they have done what they've done. Of course, a lot of folks around the country, it's hard to believe or having a hard time believing Carolina sits where they do at 20-2 and two, even after the midweek loss. Some notes to pass along from spring practice. Uh, many of you may have uh, already seen some of that up on the bigspur.com, but uh, certainly some thoughts to pass along to coincide with those notes from both Alex Jones and Hale McGranahan. Chris Phillips will be here today from the Spurs Up show as well as it is uh, Thursday. Sweet 16 matchups get going tonight, Phil, and we uh, will look forward to that. Uh, it's another great weekend of, of college baseball and the Nana Sports chat box. We're going to do our very best to take all of your questions, comments, and concerns and make them a part of the fun we'll have here over the next couple of hours. Signorama is the preferred sign partner of Gamecock Athletics. Everywhere in Columbia, you see their work. Williams Bryce Stadium, Founders Park, Colonial Life Arena, and more. If you make your way down to Founders Park to tomorrow, you will walk in the center field gates, as everybody does, and you'll walk right into a couple of national championship banners. Yep, that's Sinorama's work in addition to pretty much everything else you'll see there. Sinorama.com. They are, of course, as we often tell you, Gamecock owned and operated. And um, they can do anything from vehicle graphics, indoors, outdoors, banners, tablecloths. Maybe you've got some type of uh, event coming up. You need to have some just some tablecloths or something made. Sinorama in Columbia. Sinorama.com. Hey, Phil. Hey, tablecloths. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Think about that for Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. Hey. Some special oh. tablecloths. Yeah. Yeah, like the Mol Molinax family meal tablecloths or something. Yeah, that's right. Something, yeah, some, some high-tech graphics to, you know, <laughs> pour gravy all over. <laughs> <laughs> I, man, Christmas is my, is my jam. You know, we, we, we're ready to rock and roll by pretty much November 1st. And we start getting lights up about two weeks into the month of November. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're early birds on that. I used to not be, I used to be strictly wait until after Thanksgiving uh, is traditional. I get it. It should be. I also have children now who they just love it. So we just continue to add and add and add. And we have this big thing in our neighborhood and, and our house is pretty competitive. I'll be honest with you. It's uh two days worth of work. So it's, you know, we, we, we can compete. Um, with all that said, th there is no day in the world, I think, that is better than Thanksgiving. Because oh, yeah. you know how it is, Phil, when you wake up on Christmas and you got kids opening gifts and You've just got a lot going on. Now, our family, you know, our family rotates the family Christmas party, Thanksgiving and Easter amongst what's well, been passed down to our generation now. So there's four houses that it rotates through. So we, we're on a rotation of a schedule. Um, so there is always somewhere to be. Actually, this year, I think we host Thanksgiving in our house. Uh, but with that said... Thanksgiving is just so relaxing, man. All you all you have to worry about doing is eating. Like that's it. You know, there's no gifts, and you're not, uh, you know, you're not trying to, you know, make sure that the kids are in bed before Santa gets there. And it, it's just, it's just so relaxing. So it is nice. I, it is nice. I think I it's my favorite cook, day of the year. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I even cook, and it, I find that relaxing. I mean, it's not that. I mean, it's a huge meal and a big deal, but I don't know something about being in there, knowing that you know. Once it's all done, you just get to sit back and relax. Yeah. Oh, it's great. No, Thanksgiving's my favorite holiday. Favorite yeah. holiday. Christmas is always well, I, until I had kids, it was always a big pain in the butt. But now that I got kids, it's a bit more fun and you know, yeah. Getting to watch them enjoy everything. And yeah, but yeah, we typically tend to host on Thanksgiving uh here the past few years. Although we every year, you know, like afterwards. That Friday, we're like, okay, next year we're going out of town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But every time it comes back around, it's always like, well, let's just have everybody over again. You know, it's always nice to have the house full of everybody. And yeah, ever since, you know, my, my grandparents obviously were the big hosts, uh, you know, moving forward. And the generation below them just didn't quite pick it up, uh, parents, aunts, and uncles, and things like that. So yeah, we're, yeah, we keep it alive. Uh, Bruin Nation, actually, Muschamp said it's a meal, not a day. 
Mm-hmm. He said it's a meal, not a day. Just a meal. Um, but I, I don't agree. I don't agree with him on that. So, and I told Will that before. I remember when he said it. He was on my show not long. I, I think it was actually maybe a couple months after. And I said, Coach, come on. It's a day. Thanksgiving's a day. He said, well, we'll have to agree to disagree, Jamie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. So that's that. Um, but, um, yeah, anyways, uh, so, but we've got but Easter like coming up it. first. J.B. Griswold, though. Look at that. I like it. Oh, yeah. On. yeah. I mean, you will really do it up, huh? Like, uh, oh, yeah, it's big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's big we, we've i've actually i'm adjusting the theme a little bit this year we've got we're adding more reindeer and um and what we're forming a christmas creek through the front yard with blue sparkling lights and we i i can't give away all of it but as we get closer right, yeah. <laughs> a few months down the road uh once we get them all up in november uh certainly everybody will will see it matter of fact i'll make that part of the backdrop from time to time and oh awesome and, mm -hmm. and um and then maybe we'll have like a Christmas light contest. Anybody that can can uh, anybody that wins our Christmas light contest here, we'll give them a prize or something. But uh, so we'll put that in our notes. Hey, we'll when we have our fall uh, show prep meetings, we'll we'll make sure to accommodate that into our our on air schedule. How about that, for Deal? sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, into the Nana Sports chat box we go. Good morning to everybody. It is nice to see you. Hey, Hope. It's so great to see you today. Thank you for sticking around. 76 asks, uh, what does a yellow patch on the jersey mean while practicing? Well, they have yellow jerseys. Uh, that means non-contact. Um, oh, and there you go. Uh, Clint's got it in there, too. Non-contact. Um, yeah, yellow jerseys generally are non-contact at Carolina. It could be for a lot of reasons. I mean, it could be it could be, it could be, be something's bothering them. It could be whatever. But um, So I don't ever really look too much into that. But uh, – but yep, that is a, a non-contact. And and from the desk of Hale McGranahan and Alex Jones, who by the way is doing. A, we need to give Alex some props because he's doing a fine job uh, with with the BigSpur dot com, and that was a good hire uh, for for those guys. But a couple of things from their notes from practice this morning, the the brief periods that the media uh, did get to see. The one thing that actually stood out to me uh, might might catch some people a little bit off guard here, but Alex mentioned that there were three, uh, three different players, Phil, who were receiving kickoffs, and no, kickoffs now. Xavier Leggett is no surprise. We know that uh, he's taken one to the house. Juju, once again, not a surprise. Mario Anderson is, and yeah. and mm -hmm. so, you know, you. I mean, I'm I don't, I don't know. I guess I'm stating the obvious here, right? But. You generally put guys at kickoff who number one are sure-handed. All right, you don't need a guy dropping the ball, and number two who can scoot and boogie a little bit because right. you know yeah, pretty kind of mm -hmm. nice every once in a while to maybe house one or at least get yourself up to the thirty-plus yard line better than where you would uh, be if you fair caught it, no matter where you fair catch it anymore. And and so when you see Mario Anderson's name back there, I you know I, there I don't have any context behind this. Certainly can look into it, and maybe there will be some more to pass along. Is it because they're trying him out? Is it because they have identified him already as somebody that they feel comfortable with in receiving kickoffs for either one of those reasons or both? Uh, if it is both, that should make you feel pretty good about Mario Anderson potentially as a running back. There's other things that go into being a running back, obviously, you know, vision and toughness and, and quickness and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but if he doesn't drop the ball and he moves well, it's also a pretty good sign to be a running back. So I, I, I want to look into that a little bit more. That, that certainly caught my eye. Yeah, for sure. It's a, you know, I've always, I, I was really high on Anderson still am. I mean, I think, um, Oh, I am too. You know, I'm not going to say he is the solution to the running back room because obviously that's a position you need, you know, to have a lot of depth there. Um, but from a production standpoint, I'm I'm quite looking forward to seeing what he looks like on the field because I, I think he's going to end up kind of outperforming people's expectations of him just being, you know, that transfer from Newberry. But I mean, here again, if we haven't learned our lesson yet about transfers from smaller schools, it's it's all about the evaluation at the 
at the coaching staff's level, and and you got to have faith that they're bringing in the right guys. But I'm I'm excited. For that. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you, and I see that uh, Craig, well, and John, as thin as we are, we wouldn't put Anderson back there or Juju. Well, I mean, I, I disagree with you all a little bit there. I mean, number one, you, you got to have some type of threat back there. That first and foremost, I mean. It's 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 becoming rarer and rarer that guys are getting hurt on kick returns. I mean, I haven't seen it in a while. Have you? I mean, I haven't seen that. So, you know, I I don't I I'm I'm quite comfortable in saying that that's something that this staff has thought about. Um, you know, from an injury standpoint. So there's they obviously like those guys back there, and there's probably plenty more I'm sure that are being considered. But um. I mean, while I understand the premise of both of those comments, there's no doubt. I, I get what you're saying. You know, one you already don't have anybody. One goes down, and you really don't have anybody. Uh, you know, there's there's got to be a reason why they're putting them back there, and, and there's got to be a reason why they're um, why they're willing to, uh, if you want to call it this, risk such a thing. So, you know, we'll kind of see. But you should see if Amari and Brown get something like that. You know, get some more chances like that as well. Uh, one of the things that um, Phil, one of the things that Hale said, and and this is kind of how I figured it would be because I know he's listed as a tight end, but there's just no way he's going to just be, you know, in a traditional tight end type position. But uh, in, in one of the drills they ran, Josh Simon was kind of flexed out to the right. That's probably going to be pretty common. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If he's a – he's a you just mentioned Mario Anderson as at some point in time he's going to be a guy that – um you potentially is going to be a guy that's no longer the transfer from Newberry. I, I think that, I mean, there are people like us and our friends here on our program and those who kind of monitor the message boards, follow it very closely every day. This is not going to really happen to all of you, but there, there are going to be people in the first couple of weeks in the season, something, this is my prediction something really big is going to happen with Josh Simon. And people are going to be looking around who don't follow it. Big, big fans, just not like us. They're not in the thick of it every day. And they're going to be kind of looking around either in Charlotte or at home in Columbia and going, now who, now who is this kid? Josh Simon? Oh, he's from, he's from Dalzell. Oh, well, he must be a freshman. No, shoot. He's a transfer from Western Kentucky. Like there's going to be that, that kind of come to moment of, who the hell is this kid, and why hasn't he been here for the last three years? Uh, really <laughs> like him. One of my favorite transfers in this class, no doubt about it. Yeah, he really is. And then, then it's amazing how they've recreated that tight end room from nothing. <laughs> I mean, literal nothing. nothing. <laughs> Have assembled it from zero players in there to what looks to be a fairly deep and athletic room. I mean, between Simon, Trey Knox, so you got two guys that can split out wide. Elksness, more of your traditional, I guess, kind of blocking tight end, into the line kind of guy. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how. Uh, Coach Loggins puts them to use. That's for sure. Yeah, it will be. It will be. I'm. I, I, I'm so excited about watching uh, and following along and just trying to learn, especially heading, you know, through the summer and through the fall about Dow Loggins' offense. Um, because the more that you, there is a totally different tone than there was with with. Um, Uh, it, in our in our previous two years, let's put it that way. <laughs> he who shall um, not be named. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, it's once you get on the naughty list at Carolina, it seems like you never get off of it. Um, right. You know, I like I, I, you know, you have to you have to find a way, Phil, to to, to separate, uh, you know, business from from personal. You know, uh, mm -hmm. like there was nothing at all inside of me that didn't like Marcus Satterfield as a person. I don't know him, so I don't want to ever be personal about anything. But yeah. it was, you know, as we all know, and, and if you read between the lines with a lot of what was going on within the team and, you know, if you did, did enough digging with quality people, you would find that it just – it was kind of a chaotic situation. That is not the case here. And um, 
you know, you hear these things that really stand out. They're very mature comments, you know, very mature. Like, we're, we're evaluating our talent. We're trying to see what guys can and can't do. We want to make sure that our players can do the things that we want to try to do. If they can't, we're going to throw that out. But we're going to throw a bunch at them and see what they can and can't do. And, like, it always felt like, I mean, how many times can we have this conversation in a different way? But – uh <laughs> It just always felt like, okay, we're going to keep throwing everything at them, but we're never going to take anything out. And, so, and finally, it basically until they got to Tennessee, and they're like, okay, we, this, this is enough. It's all too like, much. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we've got to figure out something else. And, um, and so then when you, you know, when you poke around a little bit with people and look, look, look there, there's a lot that's been reported, not just by the Big Spur, but by Gamecock Central and, and the Post and Courier and the state newspaper and so on and so forth. And a lot of it is on the same tone. And, and all these guys are kind of hearing similar things. There's a lot of that also hasn't been reported, um, which it, from what I understand, none of it's bad. You know, it's it, it's just, you know, they're, they're, these things just kind of filter themselves out. But, you know, those behind the scenes, off the record conversations, Phil, I know mm -hmm. the ones that I've had are unbelievably positive where it's uh, – it, it just makes sense. It just makes sense. And to add to that, you go back to when Coach Loggins was first brought up. And hats off to JC because he mentioned his name in October uh, before there was even opening here. Uh, he, he just said, this guy, I don't, I don't know. I don't, can't remember if he said that publicly on the show. Did he say it on the show, Phil? No, I don't. I can't remember if he said it publicly or not. Probably not, because we weren't at that point, really. I mean, we were just kind of speculating if a change were to be made, but I don't, I mean, we weren't saying names at that point. Yeah. <laughs> the chat yeah, box I'd... had plenty of names, and, and Loggins was not one of them, no. of course, because everybody was thinking, you know, big name, there, big name, big name. Yeah, there were two names. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it, it's it, he seems to be meshing well. I don't know. I think it speaks to... You know, going back to the kick return conversation, I think, you know, he, he, everything that we do in this program seems to be culture centered, right? I mean, that's what Beamer brought in when he first got here to, you know, make this, uh, you know, to kind of mold the culture around him and the school, I think. Uh, there is a culture of special teams uh, being an integral part of this team, as we've all seen and enjoyed over the past couple of years. It's good to see that Mario Anderson is uh, – you know, kind of accepting that as well uh, as a way to get on the field. And it's good to see that, you know, Coach Loggins is not going <laughs> to stand in anybody's way. You know, that could be a premier piece for his offense to, uh, you know, potentially be out there and, and not do special teams. So, um, you know, it all just seems like he's been a very, very good fit. I don't know, uh, you know, all the way around. And, uh, you know, and like you, JB, it's, it's the things that you hear – outside of what we get news on are positive yeah they're 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 positive in a way that makes sense like it's not it's not fluff you know what i mean it's not the it's not the jibber jabber of whatever however you want to word it because we've heard we everybody hears that all the time i mean yeah outside of coach spurrier in 2015 which by the way he ended up being right about this although he was joking about it in the preseason but Remember when he was like, have you ever heard a coach just come out and say, oh, shoot, we're terrible. You know, kickers <laughs> like the army, left, right, that's left, right. You know, you remember all that? Quarterbacks can't hit the broad side of a barn. And this yeah, yeah, that's right. You, know, <laughs> you don't ever hear coaches say, I mean, they might say things like, well, you know, we need to clean some things up. Or we haven't good as been as good as we want to be. But, shoot, we're going to get there and really like this team. You ever hear anybody that's like, yeah, I'll be honest with you, our offensive coordinator ain't worth a damn. And, uh, you know, <laughs> our offensive line is, is going to kill us this year. You know, my quarterback's going to be running around trying to survive just from play to play. You don't hear stuff like that. Um, no. Now, you will hear things like that, you know, kind of in the back office, so to speak, every once in a while, like, man, we got an issue here. I mean, we got yeah, this. Right. But, um, <laughs> but, like, but then – it, and 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 that's why that's why a lot of fans. This is my theory on it. That's why a lot of fans. We're in this world of questioning everything. Uh, you know, you you don't really take as many people at, at their word anymore. 
coaches and things like that because you've you've taken you you've been there done that you know and you're <laughs> like uh yeah i took you met his word last year we sucked so i'm not doing that again um <laughs> but the thing like with coach Loggins, uh you know to kind of gear this thing get back into the into the saddle here a little bit was you know he was of course criticized and he was going to be when when he became the leader in the clubhouse and um and was hired as i mentioned jc said that back in october i know he told me privately multiple times you know this guy is if if there's an opening he's at the top of the list Mm -hmm. and i kept asking why and he'd say well i mean i shane likes him you know i I don't know i haven't talked to shane but he but he likes him for a multitude of reasons well now you kind of start to see some of that and you got to remember like when you're an offensive coordinator in the NFL, okay, uh, in it, yes, yes, in professional sports, if you've if you've made it, I mean, we just went over this yesterday with quarterbacks, Chase Daniel and Charlie Whitehurst. They've made a combined sixty million dollars, and they've thrown about three hundred passes in their career, total combined. But so, like, yeah, there is something to say about that. Like, one, like in baseball, once you've gotten to the big leagues, you can kind of just dance around the big leagues for a while, and you're going to be fine. You just try survive in advance, get to ten years, get to, get that lifelong pension and retirement, and this, that, and the other, and, and get out. So there, there is part of that when it comes to coaches as well. Like when when you're there, there's an experience factor that people are going to continue to give you more chances, whether you have or have not earned them, but you've just earned them based on getting there. Um, kind of like the, you know, the travel journeyman a little bit. Um, but, but, but coach Loggins, like what, what I kind of learned about from him was he was with a lot of teams that weren't very good, but they thought it was him that could, could actually counter that help counter that or lack of talent. Now, I don't know how much of that is true. I mean, I've heard that from two different people in different versions of that. I'm kind of par- paraphrasing. And you also have to remember too. Phil, in the NFL, you have a 53-man roster. Okay, so when you get to college football and you're in the spring and Coach Loggins is looking out there, he he, I'm in charge of this offense. And he's looking around and he's going, oh, my God, we have, we have 53 players just on the offensive side of the ball. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's half the team. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it takes somebody who understands, like, you, you, you can't play all of those guys and you can't have a playbook that is convenient for all of those guys or you're going to have less is more, which is what mm-hmm. we've had in the last couple of years. So it takes somebody very focused, right, and very understanding of football, of personnel, and, and in that term personnel, you could probably use a bunch of stuff, age, um, you know, athlete, you know, all that type. What what type of player do I have here? Yeah, skill set. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. All, mm-hmm. all that type of stuff. And you and you and then you're playing and then you're playing chess and checkers with yourself. You're you're trying to figure out where those pieces go on the board in order to win the game. Um, yeah. and so everything I've gathered with that is that this dude's pretty good at that. Now, what we haven't seen is how does he call plays on game day. And, and that's another PTSD moment for a lot of Carolina fans. And I, hats off, I totally understand that. There's zero criticism that can go out to Gamecock fans for feeling like that. Um, you know, because with the exception of a couple of games last year, you know, you didn't really, you never really had a lot of that from Coach Satterfield. It was very much a mixed bag. And then you go prior to, and it was pretty much the same thing. I mean, we haven't, had, South Carolina hasn't had a purebred offensive coordinator since one Stephen Orr Spurrier, who was also the head coach. And if they have, we didn't see it or we didn't know it for other reasons. You know, was how, how involved was Coach Muschamp or whatever it may be. I, I, you know, I don't know. We don't. We'll never probably know the answers to all of that stuff. But we do know this about Shane Beamer. It's your. You come here. You're the coach. You figure it out. If I have to step in, we got a big freaking problem here, and um, and that's one of the advantages of coaching for him. So, so far. With Coach Hoggins, so good. Yeah, early returns look look good. <laughs> yeah, early returns yeah. look good. Yeah, and just a good guy. All right, so it's eleven twenty eight. Let's hit a um, 
Let's hit a timeout. Uh, Chris is due up next in just a couple of minutes, so hang tight. Inside the Gamecocks, powered by Electric Bikes of Charleston. We'll be right back. Family vacations, a new car, a new boat, all cost money, but you don't necessarily have to make more to afford any of that if you can save cash that's flying out the window now. I help Consulting can help you finally get the kids to Disney World, upgrade the minivan, or drop that new boat in the water next summer. Let Daniel and I help Consulting consult with you. No fees, just savings. You pay them a percentage of those savings. Save on essential services, credit card fees, you name it. Let them find it. These folks are incredible. iHelpConsulting.com. How can I help you? Just as your State Farm agent combines good neighbor service with surprisingly great rates, you can combine your home, auto, life, or small business insurance with Tony Pope State Farm Insurance today. And guess what you'll get? That's right, even more good neighbor service with surprisingly great rates. In fact, Tony Pope State Farm is your go-to agent anywhere in South Carolina, North Carolina, or Georgia for the service you deserve at the price you want. So try combining your home, life, auto, and or small business insurance today. Tony Pope State Farm has been in business for more than 30 years and can handle anything you need in the tri-state area. Once again, Tony Pope State Farm will help you mix and match perfectly. Call 843-851-2222 or visit TonyPope.com today. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. The real estate market has changed dramatically from just a year ago. Rates, supply, demand, All of your traditional factors are in a transition phase. That's why if you or someone you know are considering making a move in the low country, contact me, JB, at Coast to Coast Realty. I work with an outstanding support cast of attorneys, lenders, inspectors, insurance agents, and more, all of whom are valuable in helping find a way for you to comfortably make your real estate decision. That's right. Call me, JB, your low country real estate broadcaster. Traveling to cheer on the Gamecocks? Reserve your hotel stay with Fan Plans. Your booking supports inside the Gamecocks and the Big Spur, plus you still earn your hotel loyalty points. Visit fanplans.com slash inside the Gamecocks. What's up, Gamecock Nation? This is Ja'Kai Moore from the DMV, and you are listening to the show. Welcome back, everybody, to Inside the Gamecocks, the show brought to you by Express Sunrooms of Columbia. Give John Barber and his team a call. 803-446-4662 is how to get in touch with them. They'll be happy to talk to you about how to get some more sunshine into your life this summer. First hour of the show brought to you by Cindy Searfoss, Colwell Banker Kane Realty Team here in the upstate. Give Cindy a call, 864-414-5271. And we're joined now on the McKellar Enterprises guest line by none other than Chris Phillips of the Spurs Up Show. Welcome in, Chris. Good to see you this week. Phil, JB, what's going on, guys? Great to be here. And I guess what, JC's down in sunny Florida, uh, Orlando, Florida with the, with the fans? Something like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What he says. Yeah. We've gotten themselves. some videos. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think it's I love sober. It. Um, <laughs> one of them was early in the morning. So, Phil, he was... That was that one. Way- he was definitely sober, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a we did get a uh, we we got a play by play from the Peter Pan ride as uh, mm, um, classic yeah. as Coach O. It was awesome. <laughs> God, yeah. I mean that that video needs to be leaked somehow. Somehow yeah, it does. <laughs> oh, it's it's easy. It's easy to do. Sounds like blackmail more than anything. We're just waiting <laughs> on the right opportunity. Um, yeah. There's four in the morning, JC. He's still up, and four in the morning, JC. He's waking up. So you just. You just don't know sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Roll the dice. <laughs> um, a quick little, uh, quick little nugget here at the top of the noon hour. We'll be joined by Preston Thorne on our program as well. All right, Chris, um, we're going to get to baseball in a minute, but um, I, you know, I, I want to get your thoughts on this. Couple, you know, a couple little interesting uh, nuggets. Uh, you know, you really don't ever know until we get to September. But from practice today, both Alex Jones and Helma Granahan with a couple of things to pass along one mario anderson uh ret- returning kick so let's just start there you got to be able to catch the ball you got to be able to move a little bit uh, if you're going to return kicks what's that tell you well i mean i think he's a good athlete number one you know coming from newberry I, I don't think it matters necessarily the level if you're if you can ball you can ball right and what he did for the wolves uh, which shout out to the newberry wolves 
But, uh, you know, what he did for them, I think he's a great athlete. And I, I think it's a great opportunity this spring, guys, just give a bunch of get different dudes a look. You know, you, you, the, 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 the carry on joiner storyline, I feel like, has really taken over with him being at running back. But Mario Anderson returning kicks, I mean, why not? You know, give a couple different guys some looks. And he's got that running back vision, if you will, which can be very important uh, on special teams and making that a big part of the game. And again, we saw that with Debo Samuel, and we've seen it over the last couple of years with. With Beamer Ball, just how big of a role special teams can play. So, I mean, I love the move. Again, give different guys looks, JB. And, uh, I mean, he's obviously a guy, again, that has vision, has speed, has explosiveness. And um, I'm, ex I'm excited to see him in the spring game, right, because that's the extent that we're going to get to see most of these guys and until we get to September. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like trying everything, right? I mean, this is the time to experiment and just kind of see what guys can do, put them in different positions. You have nothing to lose. Like, hey – scrap it or you got something here and we can continue to work on it and see if it carries into the fall. But I think that could be really good for South Carolina. I've mentioned this before and I want to make sure that I mention it again. I, I, I know Mario Anderson's high school coach very well. He, mm -hmm. he coached me at Wando and um, well, kind of in the weight room, I guess, but, but um, I, I did talk to him after he committed and I just asked him, what, what do you think? I mean, can he, can he, can, can he make that transition? Well, put it this way. I, I wouldn't – and I don't know. This isn't a projection that this kid's going to run for 1,000 yards. That's not what I'm saying. But, like, he – he, I would not be regurgitating this sto story over and over if – had he told me something different. And this is not, by the way, the case of a high school coach going, oh, he's one of my guys. I'm going to – yeah, I'm going to – I'm going right. to hype him up. No, nah, no. Nah, it ain't like that, man. He, he'd be like, mm, I don't know. Um, it was very much like he's going to walk into the locker room. He's going to get along with the guys. More than likely, he's going to end up being one of the leaders around there. He's going to work his tail off. Oh, by the way, he's a pretty good football player. And as you mentioned, yeah, there's a huge difference in playing at Newberry and playing at the SEC. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that this staff wasn't interested in just signing a running back from Newberry because they just felt like they wanted to sign a running back. At the time, we didn't have the issue – or anticipate the issue they were going to have now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they 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 signed him because they liked him. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's good. All right, so the next thing, speaking of signing guys that they like, Josh Simon, a guy that I've thought, you know, he's he's a tweener guy. He's not a he's not a inside, you know, every down traditional tight end. Mm -hmm. So they kind of flexed him out today. Chris, I like he's one of my, he's one of the dudes that you just keep hearing about. And I mentioned this earlier. You, you're going to probably sit next to somebody at williams Bryce Stadium in game two or somebody in Charlotte in game one who, who's not in the thick of it, kind of like we all are every day, and they're going to go, now who the hell is this Simon kid? What, what, what did you learn about? <laughs> yeah, coming over from Western Kentucky, you know, what I think so impressive with Shane Beamer and his staff is, you know, we, we talk about South Carolina and the challenges of the job and kind of what you have to do to be successful in Columbia, at least starting out right when he came in, what the program was six wins over a two-year period, and you've got to be able to, you know, obviously people think about the Nicholas Harbors and these these top ten recruiting classes and what you've got to do with those four and five stars, but it's about, you know, can you develop the three stars you get? Can you find diamonds in the rough? It feels like, you know, Spurrier got it going, not just because he got the Alshon Jeffries and the Lattimores and kind of the no-brainer guys, the clownies, but they were able to get guys like Melvin Ingrams and DJ Swearingers and Connor Shaws and Dylan Thompsons that weren't necessarily highly regarded – and they became some of the best players in school history. I'm not necessarily saying Simon is going to do that. But, you know, you look at some of these guys, again, we're talking about Mario Anderson and then Joshua Simon, guys that, you know, maybe they don't make the headlines when South Carolina signs them or what have you, or Gamecock fans aren't talking about them coming in the season. But, uh, I mean, you look at his size, 6'4", 242 from Dalzell, South Carolina, Crestwood High School. Um, you know, he's got the size. Obviously, he made some contributions for Western Kentucky. And I just think it's so impressive the way that Beamer and company are able to identify the talent. I think we'd be, um, you know, I think it'd just be wrong to sleep on some of these guys. Now, to your point, JB, I, I'm not necessarily going in the season touting that Mario Anderson's going to be RB1 and rush for 1,000 yards or that Simon's going to be the breakout 1,000-yard receiver or anything. But we've seen them with Jalen Brooks. We've seen them with Carlin Splatel. We've seen them take guys that come from some smaller programs and, and do some big things with them. So it's really not surprising me what you're telling me, some of these reports from practice. And it is, it's just spring practice, right? We'll see what happens. It's it's funny, guys. I feel like in the spring game, there's always that one dude, it feels like every year, that that flashes in the spring game, has a big spring game, and like he just never plays. You know what I mean? It's like the spring game standout. It doesn't always translate. But, uh, 
No, I mean, that's great to hear on Simon because, again, you look at that guy, a physical specimen. If they can get him outside, it's just another weapon for Spencer Rattler and company. So it doesn't surprise me, though. They've been able to go out, sure, get those four- and five-star guys, the no-brainer guys, the guys you have to have, but also identifying talent, maybe due to her, you know, diamonds in the rough, if you will, and developing them and getting the most out of them, and I, I think they're going to continue to do that. Now, I tell you what, I tell you what, boys, I any chance I get to bring up this dude's name, it's it's uh, it's fun. I think he's a, he was a little bit taller, but he did he was a little bit lighter. But there was a guy in the as part of the uh, 2011 class who was ranked. I just I knew it was low. I just pulled it up to make sure I was right about it. He was at the time by 24/7 Sports ranked the 592nd prospect in the country. The 46th best prospect in the state of Georgia, the 26th best tight end in the country, and he went by Busta. Well, it all it all worked out because yeah. he caught 7,000 touchdown passes at Carolina, <laughs> and he only caught 7,001 passes. I mean, every ball, every ball that was thrown to him was some type of slip crossing route, and then he catch it, just hop into the end zone, and and so. Like I just kind of feel like maybe maybe he's gonna kind of I mean it's different because he's transferred he's not gonna have as much time at Carolina, but there's a role like that here for this yeah. dude. Like, you know, Buster Anderson was not an was not an every down tight end, mm. but he was a guy that you you really wanted to have him on the field because he was gonna catch it and when he caught it he was gonna end up in the end zone generally. JB, I feel like it's music to fans' ears right now. What you're saying, throw it to the tight end more, right? That's the joke every year. But it uh, it did feel like for a while, from you know the Andy Boyd days to uh, all the way to Jacob August and Hayden Hurst, that it was like South Carolina. It seemed like every pass that went to the tight end was a touchdown. It seemed like for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, as many guys as you can have like that, weapons for sure. And like you mentioned, JB, it's. Uh, I mean, what an advantage it is for the offense if you can scheme around those dudes and use their athleticism and you create mismatches. And, you know, that's why we're all excited about what Nicholas Harbor can do and the mismatch that he is for defenses. So, uh, I mean, again, if you can get that out of Simon, I mean, you're not asking him to do anything crazy, but, I mean, if you can get a three, 400-yard receiving year out of him, a couple of touchdowns here and there, and just create another threat, you're just going to open it up even more so for Juice Wells, Xavier Leggett, the rest of that receiving core. And, you know, it's going to make this offense a lot of fun. He's – it's made an interesting point, Phil. I think some people have forgotten that here in a couple of months, a guy named Nicholas Harbor is going to show up at yeah, campus. And, yeah, just just to remind everybody, not yeah. everybody who's going to be on the roster <laughs> in yeah. September. Yeah, you think you think cool spring right camps now. fun? Just yeah. for fall camp. Fall camp is going to be the real fun when getting those practice yeah. reports. Yeah. And by the yeah, way, he's Chris, running. Chris here, makes a good said. point though, yeah. in that the more uh, you know, because right now you've got Rattler and Wells, and then you've got some other guys that you know, have done good things but aren't necessarily huge names and targets that you know people are going to tee off on but the more guys that you bring onto this team that really are going to be weapons in this offense just eases the you know coverage and things like that i mean you're not going to be able to double juice every time if you've got a harbor if you've got you know assignment out there on the outside it's it, it makes it tougher for uh, defenses to actually play yeah. against you to have more talent more talent more talent yeah yeah, and then Eddie Lewis, the receiver from Memphis. I was just thinking how crazy the like portal him. is now, guys. It feels like every player is like this guy from Memphis. Amarian Brown, Georgia Tech. Juice Wells, James Madison. It's just, it's, I mean, but hey, use it to your advantage. I mean, I love that we have a head coach that's willing to go out there and grab these guys. So, um, you know, it's it's it feels like it's honestly – it benefits a school like a South Carolina the most to – you know, does Georgia need to go to the portal? Are they going to the portal? Not really. Do they need to? Not really. Does Bama need to? But a South Carolina, man, you can go out and get these guys and maybe some dudes that have played at lesser levels that they have developed at their school and they've been slept on. And maybe a guy like a Juice Wells who wants to prove his his talents at the next level and, you know, the Gamecocks are the beneficiary. So, you know, I'm just glad we're on this side of it, pulling these guys in and, and the more the merrier, I say. So Yeah, you know, I mean, Chris, even when Juice committed – uh, you know, unless you've done your homework, the, the name Juice Wells, well, well, that that was cool, but yeah. wide receiver from James Madison. I mean, I remember when he committed, somebody texted me, we just took a wide receiver from James Madison. I was like, what's your point? You know, and, well, he's from James Madison. I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah. well, kind of worked out. And then, you know, you look in, in the Nanosports chat box over here, and we're going to move on from this, but you know, these guys are all right, man. And I've said this, you know, people keep trying to project what Lenore Sells is going to do and this, that, and the other. I don't know what he's going to do. I hope he has an unbelievable career at Carolina, wins a Heisman Trophy, and goes on and, you know, breaks Tom Brady's Super Bowl record. 
But I don't know. I do know this. When Dylan Thompson committed to Carolina, 76 said, nobody on earth even knew who the guy was unless you lived in Bowling Springs, South Carolina. And then (laughs) he ended up saving the day at Clemson and statistically basically having the best year in the history of the program in 2014. Swearinger, top 400 recruit, undersized (laughs) safety. (laughs) Kind of worked out. Kenny McKinley, I had class with him, converted quarterback Mm. who – came in and it was like i don't know who this cat is oh my god he can move and, Dude, even uh, even like a pharaoh cooper i remember i remember absolutely. following along mm-hmm. with practice and i just the, the the main headline for him was yeah we moved him from a uh, db to wide receiver you know because he, he he does good things with the football in his hands when you get the football in his hands spur you're talking about it but at that point you're thinking like okay it's a guy that can't really find a position or whatever he's gonna go in through that low expectations and then he becomes pharaoh as we all recall so pharaoh, yeah, you just never know i mean you really never know man it's uh you know, you know how guys develop. I mean, there's there's a lot of things you can you can you can measure. You know, you can you can uh, evaluate in recruiting and through camps. And but you know the way some guys develop and the way some guys flourish, and you just never know. And so you just hope you have more hits than misses. Obviously, when it comes to that, but the Gamecocks are having a lot of hits lately. Yeah, Shane recruits a lot of guys like him. You know, they love yeah. the game and they're blue collar guys, and they they yeah. want to go play. So does his staff. All right, let's move on to baseball. No one saw this coming. Top twenty five matchup at home this weekend: Missouri and South Carolina. How about that? Welcome to the SEC, man. You just never know. I mean, <laughs> ask Tennessee, right? My goodness, I man. I think that was the you know yeah. I, I thought going into last week, and I was like, hey, if South Carolina if they sweep Georgia, you know that would be a really loud weekend. And I think normally it would have, and I'm not saying it wasn't, but normally it would have been. You know, something but Missouri sweeping the Tennessee Volunteers. That was something that I don't think any of us saw coming. And you look at that, and it's just the SEC, guys. It's extremely deep. You know, people have been asking me all week, what is Missouri good at? What are they not? I mean, they're pretty solid all the way around, hitting 300 and a 344 ERA. Uh, you know, one of their leaders, Luke Mann, hitting 329 with five bombs and 15 ribbies. It feels like he has been there forever. Uh, you know, Ziesler's another good player. Lovich, a good player. So they're, they're pretty solid up and down. And this is a team that was picked to finish, I think, sixth in the SEC East, right ahead of Kentucky, if I do recall. So, you know, it's one that I don't think any of us saw it being a top 25 matchup. And I know I think you guys saw the uh, uh, the reaction Tuesday night. You know, you lose a game in the midweek and the sky is falling, if you will, in college baseball. But I think the Gamecocks will bounce back the right way. I think at home, too, especially that first SEC series at home, right? I think it'll be important from those guys and what I saw from Mizzou because admittedly guys I didn't watch every single inning of that Missouri Tennessee series but they jumped all over the ball starting pitching and I mean this isn't some you know ho-hum staff this is one of the best staffs in college baseball like I don't care what you think about Tennessee if you think they're overrated or they're no good this year that staff with Burns and Dolander is still really really good so I think South Carolina's starting pitching going to be really important uh you know especially for a guy like will sanders who's been a little bit shaky in the first inning and the first innings normally when you get those kind of guys so uh getting some solid outings from your starting pitching obviously you feel good from there the rest of the way with your bullpen you're rested up all your arms good to go and you know i think this team will swing it at home but i think it's going to be guys three really competitive games i got carolina winning two of three but uh it's just another weekend in the sec man i, I just you know i know we say it in football there's no off weekends right but you know, when you play Vandy and you play some others, like sometimes the blowouts come. Dude, in SEC baseball, I mean, it's it's just a grind every weekend. And, and that's why we love it, though. I think it'll be three great games. But I do think the Gamecocks at home will have the edge on what should be a beautiful weekend for baseball, by the way. Yeah, and hats off to our buddy John Whittle because he, you know, I'm t- Chris, to your point, uh, I feel like I know this league pretty well. But if there's one team, if there's one team in the SEC that you constantly – forget about it's Missouri and and rightfully so it's you know it's not a direct shot at these guys but I mean you know they their, their previous records last year they were 10 and 20 in the league 28 yeah. and 23 overall prior to 16 and 36 they they haven't won over 40 games since 2007 they were part of the big 12 then but Whittle mentioned to us on Monday that after the 21 season their new coach cleaned out the roster and that's basically yeah. how Carolina ended up with Brant Belk last year well, now you see it, and you see what they what they were doing here. Um, at, pertaining to pitching, though, James Hicks, yeah, he's it's it's nice to have a guy that you can do anything you need to do with, and I'll really be interested to see where his role comes into play this weekend. 
Yeah, I think it'll depend on just kind of scores and situations. And, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of high-pressure situations. You know, my, my key player of the weekend, that, and I, you could have named a bunch of different guys, but I said it was Chris Veach just because I'm not going to be surprised we get the eighth or ninth inning and we're going to be in a closeout situation and he's going to come in. And I think right now he is your closer, right? So, um, you know, giving him that opportunity. And your bullpen is going to need to be on point, right? I mean, there's going to be some games late where you're going to have the lead in a close ball game. And, um, you know, if your bullpen can't get the job done, it might cost you. So, yeah, a guy like James Hicks, though, JB, to your point, you know, Mark Kingston called Eli Jerzenbeck a weapon in the preseason. I think James Hicks, you could also throw that that mm-hmm. title on him because it just feels like – I mean, this is a dude that at any other SEC school, he's he's a weekend starter, right? And, he, and some schools he might be their Friday night guy, especially the way he's throwing it. So, um, you know, is the stuff necessarily overpowering? No, but he's just got such great movement and sync on the fastball, and he's just so hard to hit, and he looks – he looks so comfortable and so composed, and I think that's what I'm so happy about when I watch him pitch is, you know, maybe some guys would would hang their head. You know, you were in the starting rotation last last year and the weekend rotation last year, and you get Tommy John, and now you're no longer in that. Some guys might hang their head, woe is me, lost my role, but I feel like he's really embraced whatever his role is, you know, which is just to be a really good pitcher in relief. So, um, And a guy that, of course, you could start. You could start him in the midweek. I mean, guys, how valuable a piece is he going to be in the SEC tournament? in the postseason, right? I mean, that's a hell of a guy to roll out there to start a game for you. So um, I think it'll depend on the situation. But, I mean, guys, if you get to the, let's just say, the seventh inning tomorrow night and, you know, you're up 4-3, why would you not put him in there, right? I mean, he's just been automatic for you. Yep. And, um, with you. you know, mm-hmm. I, I think for sure. I think I, I wouldn't be surprised he's the first guy to the pin. Well, let's, let's put it this way. It's a really good sign if you don't see game <laughs> six on Friday night. Or a really bad yeah. sign, but let's just hope it's a really good sign. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there is You're no in between. Put, yeah. Yeah. You're not putting him in down seven. Right. All right. No. Um, all right. Final one for you. I know you got to go. Uh, so it, it's too early to play this game, but that matters. Our show, so we're going to play it anyways. They're 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 twenty and two, mm-hmm. and they're three and zero. Oh. Mm-hmm. And if anybody remembers when the original twenty three schedule first came out, it was like. <laughs> Ooh. And then they had, they went back in and got some things changed. So the first nine, um, you know, I actually thought they might run into a little bit of an ambush last weekend until Braswell saved the day, and then they ambushed the hell out of Georgia. So now they're three and zero. You've got uh, they're all winnable series when you're good, but mm-hmm. you have what seems like an opportunity here with Missouri at home, and then it's not easy to play at the dude. And it's not easy to win on the road, but they are like royally struggling. And there's some internal issues going on yeah. in Mississippi State. So if you, if Carol, let's play this game. If you get out of the first nine at blank, you are set up for a national seed. I think seven and two. I mean, I think if you just take two of three the next two weekends, I mean, God, who wouldn't have taken seven and two going into the LSU series? And if you do that, guys, you are a top 10 team with LSU coming to town, who's probably yep. still going to be number one. And you'll have that opportunity to really make that big statement and I think make a stake for, hey, we should be in that national seed discussion coming down the stretch. So, you know, you don't have to sweep, guys. I mean, that, that's the big thing. I think you and I all know that, uh, you know, in baseball, as long as you're winning series, and what was that? I think you said, JV, last week that Ray Tanner used to say that as long as you just don't get swept on the road, we're fine. Well, yeah. when you sweep on the road, I mean, that's a huge exclamation point. So, <laughs> yeah, I think as long as you're 7-2. I mean, listen, anything better is, is a dream start in SEC play. Um, and you'll have, listen, you'll have the opportunity this weekend at home again, but I think Mizzou is a really good ball club, and they're extremely, extremely hot right now. So if you're able to sweep again, I mean, I would be, I'm not going to say I'd be totally shocked, but it'd be somewhat of a surprising result again, the way that Missouri's playing, the confidence they're playing with, et cetera. But, and then you mentioned going to the dude and Mississippi State. I mean, my God, I, I guess they sold their souls for that national championship because they have just been a train wreck ever since. Um, but yeah, you come out of that seven and two going in that LSU series. I, I think you're this ball club is for real, uh, you know, and th- there'll be a long way to go. Still a lot of SEC ball to play. But I think if you come out of it seven and two, I think you're realistically looking at finishing with maybe 18 or 19 SEC wins. And m- maybe you're right there at the end. Maybe it comes down to the last series or two for the SEC East. I think that's that's what that type of start would indicate. So, yeah, I mm-hmm. think you're in that uh, that that conversation for the national seed. If you can get the seven and two guys, it's a huge success. I, I'm with you. I think if you take if you, you if you can get that, take care of your your midweek contest. You're going to lose one or two of those a year. They've already done that, so hopefully mm-hmm. that's out of the way. But you take care of your midweeks. So you you open at seven and two somehow. Again, we're putting the cart way before the horse here. <laughs> uh, you're you're nine wins shy of 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 it being 
totally in the conversation in the mm-hmm. league for a national seed, uh, which would get you to 16 wins. You are 10 wins shy with, you know, six series or with um, seven series to go uh, of being a lock. Because seventeen and thirteen, forty plus wins. Yeah. Oh, you're a lock. Yeah. In the in the SEC. It's yeah. And what's crazy if you do that, guys, if you get to that point, you'll I think you'll pretty much match, if not surpass, last year's win total. Not that that's saying anything, but uh it's pretty it's just wild when you have that kind of perspective. Just where we were this time a year ago, you know, guys, today is one year to the date that it was the day after South Carolina lost to the Citadel down there in Charleston. So it's uh, you know, we've seems like we've come a long way in a year, but yeah, there's a great opportunity over the next couple of weeks. I think JB, and when we were looking at the schedule in the preseason, you just kind of said to yourself, you know, when it comes to SEC schedules, it's hard, but this thing sets up about as well as you could ask. And again, if you can come out at seven and two, man, I think that LSU series, I mean, it's it's gonna remind you of 2010 to 2012. The electricity at Founders Park is gonna Ooh. be unreal. Yeah. Easter weekend, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah, that, that's gonna be that's gonna be some fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh the Spurs Up show. What, what you got on the show today? Man, we're just taking questions, comments, calls, talking ball, the usual, man. It's it's fun to uh kind of just open the floodgates and let the conversation organically go where it goes. So um nah man, just just talking everything, man. I mean, it's funny. I go into it unscripted. That's what kind of makes it a beautiful thing. So that's sometimes that's just how you have to do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Nothing else. Like, yeah, I put a tweet out. I was like, hey, come on, everybody. Let's uh, jump in the chat box and drive yeah. this conversation yeah. today. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, look, yeah. you know, Preston Thorne texted me 20 minutes ago and said, hey, I'll be on at 12.05. Oh, okay. I guess we'll schedule that. So, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you never know. Sounds nope. good. Thanks, Chris. Uh, have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Yeah, JB, Phil, appreciate you guys. We'll talk soon. Yes, yeah, sir. Man, thank there you. Go. For- All right, so we – um we're not going to squeeze in a final break here, Phil. We'll just ride this thing out cool. to the end of the hour. And uh, if you'd be so kind to keep us on track an hour or two, we'll make sure that we get three in there. Um, but you know, it is, I, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty cautious about things like that. I, I don't like to put the cart before the horse, uh, with Carolina and predicting records and this and the other number one, from a personal standpoint, you get burned. If it doesn't work out, some, Somebody comes back and yells at you down the road. Um, number two, you just don't know how it's going to work out. But with that said, you know, it's been a while since you've been able to kind of speculate those things around here. So I just, you know, it's it's okay to to have some of those fun conversations and maybe to start to dream a little bit. They, To his point, if they go two of three this weekend and they're five and one. Mm-hmm. Yep. You, uh, then you're... Back to the okay. Let's just don't get swept on the road at Mississippi State. I don't care how good or bad they are. Yeah, don't get swept on the road. That's what it comes. Anything more than that, you're you, you know you, you're playing with, you know you, you see them. You know what I'm saying. Well, anything you know at this point, if if you if you apply the two lines of thinking, don't get swept on the road and win your series at home in the SEC, just for the SEC conference play you finished the year 17 and 13 and i don't know who wouldn't take that record (laughs) coming out of this year's sec because at that point you're hosting you're you know i mean you've got everything in the postseason in front of you at that point if you take care of business in the midweeks there's no question you know (laughs) if you if you run ring up 14 more wins um in the sec that gets you to 34, and I think they've got uh, seven midweek games left, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't, that, isn't that it? One, two, uh, yeah, I think three, so. I think so. Four, and in those five, numbers, I mean, you're you you allowing two one, losses to Auburn. <laughs> you know, I yeah. mean, there's you know, yeah. there's there's games in there that you're like, oh, you're not you you've got a better chance of sweeping this team than you do to losing two. Yeah. So I mean, it's but I, you can't stress enough how a softer early season schedule has is probably going to pay big dividends when we're looking at May. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, and, and uh, to, to be fair to the, and I don't think that's, you didn't mean for it to come out this way, but to be fair no, with the no. conversation, certainly didn't see Missouri walking in like this. Uh, but what you're getting at the original 23 sec schedule before they had to change some things or, around yeah yeah was like it was literally i can't remember the exact order but the first five series were something like 
Vandy, Tennessee, Arkansas, Florida, and LSU. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, that and then looking Braves at it, and not get out of that. Like, yeah, yeah, and looking at it year over year comparatively in your pre, you know, conference schedule, you know, not playing a, yeah. you know, a, a big series against Texas or a huge name like that where you, you know, are going to dr- may drop two out of three or they'll get swept. So yeah, I, I mean, well, like it's, Craig said, you have some slip up room in the conference. Yeah, yeah. that's going to happen. Like you're going to lose games in this league against teams that aren't as good as you. Like that's that's, yeah. that's the nature of the beast. You're, uh, but their starting pitching that day was as good as yours. Um, or maybe yours just, for whatever reason, had a bad day. So, yeah. And that's what we're about the midweek game is that, you know, we, we had one bad inning. Yeah. <laughs> you know, defensively, you have one bad inning. And you, I mean, that's, but that's baseball, man. You just I actually, know. yeah, I actually <laughs> forgot they lost that game. Yeah. Oh, heading into conference play is that, oh, we dropped a midweek game and it's not all, you know, the sky is falling and torches and pitchforks. <laughs> no. <laughs> now only you start stringing my... these up and it's going to get ugly. <laughs> only only a couple of people. I, I do find it funny every once in a while just to like peek at the comments on Twitter. Like, <laughs> like take, take Praswell out, put so-and-so in. You're like, you do realize you're tweeting to a uh, Twitter account. He has <laughs> nothing to do with the the roster and coach Kingston, by the way, is not checking the comments on Twitter to figure yeah, out his right. coaching move. It's, it's probably some volunteer undergrad doing that, you know. <laughs> who, exactly. who runs the social for uh Gamecock men's basketball? baseball? <laughs> oh, man, for anybody's social media, it doesn't matter. The Yankees, the Packers, it doesn't matter. Oh, you know, there's yeah. people they wake up, you know, they're looking around mom's basement going, What am I gonna do today? Let's see how the Packers are doing. Ah, god damn it. No, this guy has, he ran yeah. the wrong way. <laughs> All right, yeah. Okay. Let me in there. I can do a better job. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's hit a timeout. Preston Thorne up next. What's up, Gamecock fans? This is Pitcher Noah Hall. If you want some delicious food for your event, I suggest visiting nanasports.com today to find out what they all have to offer. It's really good Southern cuisine based out of Charlotte, my hometown. I hope you guys go check it out. Go Cox and go Nanas. Are you looking to buy a new home? Kevin O'Connell with Union Home Mortgage is a local mortgage expert and Gamecocks fan servicing North and South Carolina. Whether you're buying a home, building your dream home with new construction, or turning your equity into cash, UHM's world-class service will ensure you find the perfect mortgage to achieve your home ownership goals. Call Kevin at 803-906-0244 or visit UHM.com today. Union Home Mortgage is an equal housing lender. NMLS 2229 LONMLS 1772182. Electric Bikes of Charleston offers the most fun you'll ever have on two wheels. The home of Oventon, Velotric, Magnum Bikes, and more, they sell to consumers all across the state and offer outstanding warranties and service after the sale. Their electric bikes are equipped with five levels of pedal assist plus a throttle so you can ride longer, handle the heat better, but still get great exercise. Bikes are available for all ages and sizes. Visit electricbikescharleston.com or stop into their store in Mount Pleasant if you're in the low country. Electric Bikes of Charleston, powering inside the Gamecocks, the show. Hot skillet with a little oil. Welcome back, everybody, to Inside the Gamecocks, the show presented to you by Express Sunrooms of Columbia. Give John Barber and his team a call. 803-446-4662 is how to get in touch with them to set up a no-obligation consultation about turning your backyard potentially into an outdoor retreat. An outdoor and, retreat? Yeah, I, was, yeah I, I just saw your... Uh, uh, 
note here. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering where you went. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just disappeared. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I don't We've know. got Preston in Good without deal. the video, but that's all right. I could have put a. Uh, before we get to him, though, let me remind everybody about the plunder on Polly's coming up on July twenty first. Yeah, man. And July twenty second, two person teams. Uh, as part of uh, TravelingCountryClub.com's uh, second annual Plunder on Polly's. It is not just for Traveling Country Club members, although you should be a Traveling Country Club member because this is like one of the only clubs in the world that has allowed me to get into it. If they let me in, they'll let anybody in. I'm just kidding. Uh, TravelingCountryClub.com, over 40 golf courses in the Carolinas, Charleston area, Hilton Head area. Myrtle Beach, Myrtle's Inlet area, Columbia area, Greenville, Charlotte. I mentioned they're about to add Mount Mitchell Golf Club, and uh, they've already got um, you know a course in Waynesville, North Carolina, in there. So it's all pretty cool stuff. There's some great courses to play, and the Plunder on Polly's will play at two of those great courses uh, up in the Myrtle Beach area: True Blue and Caledonia. Exceptional golf courses. Uh, so make sure you check out travelingcountryclub.com, and I'll make sure that this is posted to our social media as well. If you like to play golf, uh, the potential prize, it just kind of depends on the total number of registrations because it's going to sell out, but be, but because they're using a couple of courses, they can actually add more people um, up to a $12,000 purse in this thing. So, you know, if, if you don't win JC's $10,000 this year in our March Madden's bracket and you can play a little golf, or if you do, you could be the rightful winner of about twenty grand over the next couple of months thanks to Inside the Gamecocks, the show. TravelingCountryClub.com. All right. Uh, appreciate Chris there. Uh, plenty to get to an hour or two, but we'll lead off with uh, former Gamecock and current co-host up on 107.5 The Game. The early game with with Bill Gunner. I don't know how he does it sometimes, uh, but Preston Thorne is popping in with us for a little bit today. What's up, man? What's going on, fellas? How y'all doing today? Where you at? Where are you, good, man, man? I'm you know I'm traveling as always. I'm right now. I'm in the parking lot of the USC Education Building, so I'm sitting out here, uh, sitting out here in the car. So what at what time are you getting up to get into the studio in the morning? You know, I, I got it down to a routine, Jamie. Uh, yeah. I'm usually up at around my alarm clock goes off at 4:55. <laughs> yeah. I am uh, I am in the bathroom now. Whether that is to take a full shower or just a bird bath, it depends on the timing. And then uh, I'm out the door at about 5:15 to get downtown. Man. I remember my morning show days. It's bright. It's been seven years, but I, I had my alarm clock set because I only lived like ten minutes from the studio, for like five eleven or something. I knew it to the minute, and I knew if I got out of the house by like five thirty seven, I'd be there by five forty five. I'd already done some prep the day before. We'd have about ten minutes to clean anything up, and and then it was go time. I mean, you literally, if you have to start at 6 a.m., you have it down to the minute, don't you? Oh, no doubt. No doubt. If I, I'm, if I live out in the northeast of Columbia, for those that are not familiar, but, you know, I'm, I'm coming down, I'm coming down two notch and I get on 277. I'm like, all right, if I get to 277 by 537, I'll get to, this, <laughs> to the studio by 543, which will give me three minutes to get inside. I'll get 10. Yeah, you have it down almost to the second, for sure. Well, I certainly appreciate you and Bill having me on 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 Monday mornings, sometimes Fridays, but uh, mostly on Mondays. We I have fun with y'all in there. I'm glad that you're in there with him. Uh, it's a really good, really good program. Um, uh, Preston, you know, so obviously Bill and and others, us today are are probably leaning on you a lot because Carolina's back on the practice field, and um, you know this is a very highly anticipated spring practice session for the Gamecocks uh you know they've they've got some answers we know that they've got some questions we know that one of those is you know how will everything unfold with with coach Loggins but one of the conversations that we've we've kind of been having around here today um has to do with the fact that you know Josh Simon a kid who transferred in from Western Kentucky for instance he, he's a Dalzell kid Mario Anderson uh, you know, he, he went to, went to Stratford, a school that you and I both, we, we both love to hate. Um, cause you're a Somerville guy. Uh, 
but but he, but these are blue collar kids that are they're going to be called their numbers going to be called on a lot to call to make a big impact. And it just seems to me, Preston, over the last thirty plus years that I've been around Carolina football, the better seasons are generally filled with a lot of blue collar football players that weren't maybe necessarily the top one or two guys that were in some recruiting class. But they were a bunch of guys that came in and worked their tails off. And you've got a coach, by the way, who does the same thing. Man, I think you hit it. You hit the nail on the head, man. I, obviously, there's going to be years where we as a state, we have the top talent. When you think about those Spurrier years where it's Lattimore or Clowney or things like that. But people also don't remember that those teams were filled with DJ Swearinger, Kelsey Quarles, uh, Devin Taylor, all of these guys who were not very highly recruited, but – there was coaches on staff who had enough of, the, of a discerning eye to know that they could go and mold these guys into what really fills out the rest of a roster because football is not like basketball where you can just have one guy that changes the impact of a team. You have to have a group full of dudes who are basically just guys on the team that round out the roster who are ready to grind, who are ready to fill out their their specific roles, play their play their role, do their job. And if you have a bunch of guys – especially for these players who are – it's their dream to play in the Garnet and Black because they played on other teams. So for them to get back to the point where they're playing at South Carolina, those dudes, there's, there's no question in my mind that they're going to be highly motivated to play. All right, so you you were part of the – hold on now. I'm not trying to age you here. You were part of the 2000 recruiting class, right? I was, yes. Okay. So, obviously, that was 2000 and 2001. Uh, anybody that's been around this program, either since then or prior to then, remembers literally every detail about those those two years because of what it followed, um, the, the 0 and 21 streak and all that type of stuff. Um, what, what, ha- on that same note, having those blue collar type guys, Kind of de- describe what what y'all went through, and and the leadership that was that was in that locker room. Because what I'm what I'm getting at here, Preston, is trying to explain how that mentality carries its or, or makes its way through a locker room to change a program. Yeah, man, that, that's that's the bulk of that's the bulk of the team. And if you look back at that 2000, even the 99 and 2000, those recruiting classes, it's not going to be filled with a bunch of five-star guys you're gonna have a bunch of uh, dudes who are playing their roles dudes who are obviously talented but are willing to play up to being instead of going from a four-star to a three-star you you go the other way to where they're a three-star and with training and work and all of those other intangibles you turn into a four-star and that builds the culture of the team I and unfortunately Jamie I was part of the 03 and 04 teams who were Mm-hmm. Way more talented, in my opinion, than those early teams, but we didn't have the leadership that we were more highly recruited, better players on paper, but we didn't have the leadership, we didn't have the character, all those intangibles that you all know makes up a team. And so I've seen it both ways. How, do, how does that happen? Like, what, what, you know, if you can describe what happened. Not that I don't want you to call out any of your teammates or anything like that, but you know, describe what what that change looked like and felt like when you were in that locker room, especially after the 01 season. You, you go nine and three, you beat Ohio State again, and and then you you open up in two thousand and two. Seemingly, oh my gosh, Coach Holtz has this thing on on track, and it 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 just kind of began to erode a little bit. Like, can, can you yeah. remember some of the specifics and explain to us how that kind of happens and how quickly? Yeah, it there's a happen? lot. Of, there's there's a lot of varying factors. I think so. If you look at that uh, that O two season, I think we started off four and one, five and one, or something along those lines. And some of those guys that were seniors on those teams, they'll probably admit that once we started facing some adversity, everybody started going towards their own agendas. Whether I was going into the NFL you know, doing those signs. So those teams weren't as necessarily as tight and cohesive as those earlier teams because I think success, even though it wasn't national championship success, it was success for those teams at that time. And then on top of that, the coaching staff started going after some guys who were, again, four to five star type of players, but they weren't necessarily those guys that were leaders in the the locker room. 
They weren't necessarily the guys that were especially high character guys. You started to see some of those things start to slip, and then there started to be divisions in the team about you know who's going to get playing time or who's doing this and who's doing that. And those teams in those in my later years, we were. I would say we were solidly mediocre. And the only reason we were average is because we were talented enough to be average, but those teams weren't necessarily cohesive. If we would have had all the corny things that we talk about with teams, and Jamie and Phil, y'all know, people get tired of hearing them, but but they're true. We had those earlier teams. They were cohesive. We all had the same mission. We all believed in the same values, whereas the later teams who were more talented, we did not have that, and our, and our record reflected that. Yeah, it seems kind of similar, Preston, to what we experienced at the end of the Muschamp era, too. It was it's like you're just solidly mediocre. You got excellent talent and players on the team who are going to, you know, move up to the next level, but it just didn't turn into a cohesive unit on the field. Absolutely, I, I can. You can easily see how that how that happens with teams because as a fan, you're looking, you say, "Man, we got all these guys. They're playing in the NFL. They're they're, they're highly talented, well recruited, all of that stuff, but it's just not working." And that's stuff that we as fans on the outside looking looking in, we'll never be privy to those information. We'll never be able to have see what's actually happening on a day to day basis. All right, uh, Preston Thorne, it's twelve fourteen here on March the twenty third, heading into another big Gamecock baseball weekend. Uh, but uh, talking some spring practice stuff, uh, Preston, of course, the co host of the early game on one hundred seven five, the game in Columbia with Bill Gunner. All right, so. Uh, we've heard a lot in the last week or two, Preston, you probably heard similar things about Spencer Rattler and how he has basically shown up to spring practice and he understands and he feels like this is his team. And, uh, those that are out there on the practice field, they know it's his team. So when you go back and you were just a young buck and you were on the defensive side of the football, I get it. But, but there was a guy R.I.P. One of the great ones, Phil Petty, that you got to play with, and that was his team in 2000 and 2001. What What did you see as a young player? How would you describe what a true uh, leader, a quarterback leader, is of a club, and how would you kind of compare that to what we're seeing out of Spencer Rattler right now? Yeah, man. Obviously, obviously, rest in peace, Phil. Man, the um, the thing about seeing the leadership from a quarterback position is it's the guy that sounds so cliche, Jamie, and I hate to repeat it, but it's when he steps in the huddle, everybody's eyes are on him. You know, Phil was, Phil was very stoic in, in, in manner, but I, the, the thing I remember about stoic is about Phil is he had re- relationships with every single person on the team. So as you said, I was a younger guy on the defensive side of the ball. There really wasn't any re- reason for Phil and I to have a re- actual relationship, but he did. He'd be like, man, what's up, PT? How you doing today? Blah, blah, blah. And that's the sort of thing that he carried along throughout the game. And when when the players, when Phil got in trouble, the players wanted to play for him. I think it's a little different with, with Spence because Spence is so overwhelmingly talented that he's actually the most probably the most talented player on the team besides maybe taking out juice. And so that's another reason why players wanted to follow him. There was no, nobody's going to say that Phil was the most talented quarterback, but he had all the intangibles. Mm -hmm. Spencer has the talent. And now it seems like from all the reports that he's growing into the intangibles where now guys actually want to follow him as the leader of the team. So I've always said, you know, obviously I'm, Oh, I think we lost. Nope. Are we losing? No, he's still there. It just something happened. Hmm. Maybe his phone rang. Oh, <laughs> is that a is that a problem? Oh, there no, he is. I, no, no, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we, we can hear you. you. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, cool. No, I was I was just saying that. Um, I always make fun of quarterbacks because I'm a defensive guy, so you know they wear a different jersey. They can't get hit, that whatever. But honestly. If a team has a quarterback where everybody knows that he's the leader of the team, he's the guy we want to follow, that can go a long way. Spencer has always had the talent to be that. Now it seems like he's growing into some of the intangible parts. Yeah, you know, it's it's on the Phil note, I, I found I found this fascinating for a long time. I, I remember talking to Kimry 
Uh, probably, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago, uh, Preston, uh, you know, talked about obviously the fade. Everybody always wants to talk to Eric about the fade. And I remember him saying to me, um, yeah, I didn't want to let our team down. I knew I only had one chance, one throw, but I really didn't want to let Phil down. And I also remember years ago when Dylan Thompson, you know, had to get in there for, for, for Connor and, and play in the Clemson game. And I remember him thinking, you know, wanted to beat Clemson rival can't stand him didn't want to let my team down but god i didn't want to let connor down because i felt like if connor could play in the game we would have won the game it is amazing how some quarterbacks demand respect but then when backup quarterbacks get into a game they're they're also playing to not let the guy down who starts in front of them that that to me that says all you all you need to know that says team and i i kind of feel like that's where this group is like if for some reason luke Doty had to get in there or whomever it may be you know, Spencer Rattler has cemented himself enough to where they're like, hey, we know this is your team, and and, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we don't let you down as well. Yeah, that goes back to all the, all the best teams. All the best teams, everybody knows knows their role. I, I, I've said this before, you know, those, those 2000, those 2000, 2001 team, I, you know, I was backing up Langston. I was getting 20 snaps a game or something along those lines. I had more fun that season being on a winning team having a defined role than the seasons later when I was starting, but we were averaging, not really, didn't really have a rudder or a purpose of what we were trying to accomplish. So when that, when, that, when, when everybody is really focused on that particular specific goal and Luke goes out there and says, you know, I'm focused on making my teammates better. If the time comes up, I can believe that that's, it sounds like it's hogwash, but I can actually believe that. All right, final quick ones here, and we're going to let you run, brothers. I know you've got you got some stuff to do. Um, I mean, clearly you played for Coach Holtz. We got to see what Coach Spurrier was able to achieve here. Um, Coach Muschamp showed up to South Carolina with coaching experience. Obviously, people will tell you it wasn't good coaching experience. No, he didn't have he wasn't successful at Florida, but um, but he but he had been a head coach before. Shane Beamer arrived with none of that. Uh, not even no, nowhere near the resume of any of his predecessors. What what have you? How have you watched him grow? Where would you say he has grown the most in, in becoming the leader of this program? And now that we've kind of seen him talk and listened to him talk and watched him coach a little bit here this spring, it's his third spring practice in charge of Gamecock football. Has anything stood out to you? Yeah, I think he's um one. And this is a – I'm trying to figure out the proper way to say this. <laughs> <laughs> he has learned to control his emotions. Hmm. And you see it on the sideline. He's still very excitable. He's still very much um, into the game, and that's what we as a fan base, we really do appreciate. But sometimes during his first season, even a little bit last year, sometimes early, you would see that kind of – maybe distract him from making the next play or doing the next thing that he needed to do on the sideline. And that's just in game. And you can sort of see sometimes where you would see uh, Coach Limbo would have to be the wise sage and kind of like calm him down, like, hey, Coach, what are we going to think about doing next? And you've seen him sort of growing that. I imagine you don't want to tamper away. You don't want to take away his excitement and his genuine affection for the team and the love of the game. But obviously he's figured out a way to sort of to, to tamper that down. That's on, that's on the field. And the second thing, I think off the field, he's just sort of becoming his own coach. He's not living in the shadow of his dad or, or Kirby or, or, uh, or, or O'Reilly or any of those guys that he worked with. You notice him sort of referencing that a little bit less because now he has his own experiences to sort of lean on. So I think it's only, it's only going to get better because he's just going to come into more, uh, think about think about this like like Jamie Phil y'all understand when, when you first started radio you start radio and you're just trying to imitate the people that you like mm -hmm. and then as you go along you start to develop your own style you start to become who you are and I think that's what the the process that coach is going through right now I think it's a great point when I first got into media I wanted to be Mike Morgan that's it I, and you just I'm nowhere you near just, Mike Morgan all you all you try and do is you just try and imitate that person who you want to be like. Well, I think it's a great point. And, you know, as we've all gotten to know Shane a little bit over the last couple of years, for those that didn't know him prior, I mean, um, the one thing you just absolutely, when he, he says it, he said it the other day on Bussing with the Boys, uh, genuine, you know, and he, and he really is. When you talk to Preston, I, I talked to him 
a couple of times, you know, not in front of a camera or something like that. It's the same person. I mean, it's 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 really neat to see, and that's not always the case. Was Coach Holtz like that, or am I putting you on the spot here? No, you know, that's <laughs> – what's funny about that is Coach Holtz is exactly the person he is on camera who he is in real life. Uh, wise Alec, smart ass, uh, very smart, you know, but – He's gonna be he's gonna be honest with you. Years later, he responds to anything that we need from him. Wow. I've seen, you know, I've seen Coach Holtz at funerals, unfortunately. I've seen him at weddings. He's always there, but then he's like, all right, man, I'll see you later. You know, like so there's always there's always that for, for Coach Holtz. So yeah, who the exact same person coach is is on person is that's who he is on uh in, in real life too. Were were you a part of that Holtz's heroes thing that Brewer put together? I didn't get a chance to go down there, but um, a lot of the guys that went down there, they said, "Man, you know, it was just kind of like sitting at sitting at your grandpa's lap, man." And everybody just fell in line seeing Coach again. Yeah, I mean, it, it. You know, I I was always concerned when Coach Holtz was at Carolina because I, well, in '99 they they didn't win a game, but after that, every time that they played a game, it was you thought you were playing like the 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 '72 Dolphins, you know, didn't. <laughs> We got, I got SC State this weekend. We better be careful because you know, you know, they they, they run into Alabama. It's, you know, everybody's going. It was like, oh my god, you know, all right. Uh, but sure did keep people focused. At least it seemed that way. Hey man, um, really appreciate the last minute stuff. We're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna if you don't mind, we're gonna get you back on soon. I've got to uh, I got to call you anyways because I need to figure out a way to get you and and Langston down here to read some books to to the kids at school where my kids go to school. Yeah, man, just just hit me up, man. We can we can figure out where that works. I know they're down. You know, we always love for an excuse to get back home. So anytime we can get down, we love you. Yeah, we'll we'll bring you down, and I'll treat you to lunch or something while y'all are down here. Um, but um, certainly despite, appreciate. Despite, despite all that, despite all those all the all the, the newfound traffic down there, we still love going. <laughs> well, no, well, you got that right. I mean, you know all about it being from Somerville. I mean, it is just nuts. Uh, what's what's happening? But. Uh, uh, I tell you what, uh, for those that that haven't been getting up early enough to listen to the early game on 107.5 from 6 to 9, it sure is good. It was terrible before with just Bill on there. Boy, did he need some help. And, uh, <laughs> he got Preston. It, it all worked out. That's right. Thank you, buddy. We'll talk to you on Monday morning. Thanks a lot. Hey, man, appreciate y'all having me on. Phil, nice to see you. Nice to meet you. I look forward to meeting you in person. You as well. Yes, sir. Always. All right, man. Y'all be good. There you go. Preston Dorn, former Gamecock, but uh, current morning host of uh, the early game. If if Bill, for some reason, was listening to this, I'm highly anticipating a text here within the next 34 minutes before <laughs> That's we get right. off here. Yeah, you, yeah, you got it coming. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. No, he's it's all right. That's what we're here for. All right. Oh, yeah. uh, we got to hit, hit a break. We got a few to squeeze in. So we'll do our best. Hang tight. We'll be right back. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Oh, easy. He's got a tire by the tail, he has. He better hang on, too. People have spoken. Nana's Porch was voted the third best food truck or trailer by the Charlotte newspaper Public Poll. Also, their pimento cheese, mmm, took third in a contest exclusively for products made in the state of North Carolina. I will let Noah Hall tell you about the rest nana's porch southern cuisine with an uptown twist we're well into the new year and the days of being back in the pool and boat are quickly approaching many of us don't have the time to hit the gym but charleston fitness equipment can change that for you outfit your home with a treadmill elliptical or my favorite a home rower that allows you to row with the pros all over the world they have free weights home gyms flooring and much more that makes keeping or getting in shape much more convenient located in mount pleasant visit charlestonfitnessequipment.com for more get in shape like our gamecocks charleston fitness equipment proud partners of inside the gamecocks Cock nation do you need a place to stay for the big game Many hotel booking engines keep all the commissions, but at Fan Plans, you support inside the Gamecocks, still earn your hotel loyalty points, and you receive an email with direct confirmation from the hotel. Whether you are visiting Columbia to cheer on Carolina or hitting the road to follow the team, get in the stands with Fan Plans. 
family vacations, a new car, a new boat, all cost money, but you don't necessarily have to make more to afford any of that if you can save cash that's flying out the window now. I help Consulting can help you finally get the kids to Disney World, upgrade the minivan, or drop that new boat in the water next summer. Let Daniel and I help Consulting consult with you. No fees, just savings. You pay them a percentage of those savings. Save on essential services, credit card fees, you name it. Let them find it. These folks are incredible. iHelpConsulting.com. How can I help you? Uh, this is Coach O. Now back to the show. Go Tigers in the soul. Welcome back, everybody. Inside the Gamecocks, the show presented to you by Express Sunrooms of Columbia. 803-446-4662 is how to get in touch with John Barber and his team to potentially talk about enclosing a porch or a patio for you to enjoy the summer bug free outside. Great to have Preston Thorne on and he's a new guy to radio. So I can relate to that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Other, I did. I, I caught a, a video of him trying to run the, an actual soundboard, at, you know, uh, and to let people behind the curtain here. I am not running that. I'm just doing this clicking buttons on a laptop, <laughs> but that looked like a pretty daunting task there when he was <laughs> able to successfully perform. <laughs> I've had to do that before. Uh, and I won't tell the whole story, but let's just say I've had to right. pull double duty like that before, and it, it is not easy. I mean, no. it is not easy. People don't understand something, you know. When you uh, when you have a microphone, when you have a camera too, uh, but even if you don't have a camera, you can't just not talk. Like if you're hosting a radio show, you know there is no such thing as like. Let me take about 30 seconds to gather my thoughts here. That's called dead air. Yeah. You can't yeah. do it. And um, I've had this conversation a few times with people where I'm like, I don't, I don't think you I don't think you get w when you've got two hours or three hours or whatever it is to, cause this, you know, this is while we try to provide substance and information, you also want to make sure you're entertaining. I mean, I can sit here and read you the newspaper. That's substance and inf information, but it's not entertaining anybody. So, and by the way, there are radio people who've done that before, and you <laughs> could probably tell. Um, so when you have to somehow entertain for two hours, three hours, and I had to do it for three from 6 to 9 a.m. multiple times where somebody who was supposed to be there with me didn't show up. They're called co-hosts. Um, and you're trying to make sure everything's clean, audio, if you got to do him, phone, social media. But that all is secondary to making sure that, the, you know, the people that pay for everything, the spots, your, your marketing, your partners that runs. <laughs> um, if if it, It's hard. And then you have to be quick-witted enough to be able to think about what the hell you're talking about. And then you get some doofus who's never done it who tweets at you, it's the worst show ever. And you're like, well, I'm sitting here behind a, a board with 100 buttons on it. Luckily, I know what they all are, but you might hit the wrong one every once in a while. I'm trying to figure out a way to entertain you, and I don't have anybody to talk to. So, yeah, right. It's still so what do you do for a living? You yeah, know, that's right. <laughs> go F yourself. How about that? You know, those. <laughs> That's I that's you when you try this. Yeah, that's when like the blood starts to boil. I'm like, dude, you have no idea. You know, shut up. You um, know, that type of stuff. So, yeah, <laughs> maybe one day we'll do a behind the scenes of how some of this uh, some of this stuff uh, uh, really really works. So uh, there is a lot more than you would actually think when it comes to production and things of that nature. But um, no time for that right now. Uh, yeah, I thought he made some really good points, and and Preston, to his credit, has done a. I think he's done a sensational job uh, on the yeah. early game. I love, I love going on with them on Monday mornings, and um, it's it's just fun. You know, he he can speak firsthand on things, but he has enough respect for other people to not be that quote unquote know it all. Like, there are people like that out there who feel like because they've done it, they should be able to tell everybody else how to do it. Um, and he's certainly not like that. So, but we'll we'll continue to have him on. In, in in rotation on uh, inside the Gamecocks the show uh, painted garnet and black by a couple of painters by the way let me paint something.com matter of fact I've got a new client for them I was on the phone with somebody this morning who got a 
quote that I absolutely know they can beat to paint their entire home here in Mount or not here, but across the bridge in Mount Pleasant. And um, they will do that because they go everywhere in South Carolina and in Georgia. A couple of painters. Let me paint something dot com and make sure you find them on Facebook. Look at that logo. Well done, Tristan. The owners of this company just had their baby a couple of days ago yeah. and they were watching our show in their room in the hospital just hours after their little boy was born, who apparently is a 2041 recruit for Coach Beamer. That's so, right. Already on. Yeah. If, on if Shane right lasts up. here like his dad lasted at Virginia Tech, Phil, he's a, the Still family is in good shape. I mean, <laughs> that's right. That's right. And Tristan, your wife's a saint for allowing you to listen to that while she was still there. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you what. We had a uh, – yeah, no way I will ever, you know, embarrass my wife and get into all the details. But let's just say having twins is not easy. And she was in there for mm -hmm. a long time. Matter of fact, I got the call while I was on the air live in our studio on ESPN with Debbie Antonelli. Debbie Antonelli yeah. uh, posted a picture of me. She took a picture of me taking the call of, hey, we got to go. And I was <laughs> like, oh, can I finish the show or what? Uh, so, but I got home. And we were there all the way, you know, to the next day, next night. Well, kids hadn't come, and we, we had a bunch of bunch of problems, a bunch of issues, tons of them. It was a it was a nightmare. But we hadn't gotten to the issues yet, and it was seven o'clock on March first. Uh, uh, the children, our children, were born just after midnight on March second, and uh, seven o'clock March first, twenty nineteen. That was game one of Clemson Carolina baseball. <laughs> And I was like, so, you know, while we're just hanging, is it cool if I cut the game on my phone? Or, And she let me watch it. And they won. <laughs> and uh, a couple hours later, little Rugrats came rolling along. So, And here they come. Yeah, that's we've all, uh, <laughs> I'm with you, Tristan. You know, I got, I carried, uh, carried somehow the Gamecocks into the delivery room. <laughs> I, I get it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Poor kids. Poor kids yeah, don't it's have good a to chance. know uh, 76 has us on here while he's in his bathroom. <laughs> oh. Okay. Hey, that's fantastic stuff. <laughs> Is he on the phone or do you have a TV in your bath? Is if you got a TV in your bathroom, where you know Oh, I hope he has a TV in this bathroom. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Jamie says one thing I'll back porch. <laughs> I will do what now? Oh, I'm still trying to get another one for my back porch. My outside TV died, and it's ugh, it's oh, awful. Oh, no. I know. I'm watching stuff yeah. on my telephone. Hard to watch baseball on the phone. Yeah, <laughs> you need to get a TV for the back porch. Don't uh, do what I did. Don't order one from Amazon. Uh, the first one will show up broken, and then the second one will also show up broken, and then you'll have to call them and mother F them for about 20 minutes, and they don't care. So they'll just give you your money back, and then you got to go find another one. Just And then you got to go get one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just yeah. kind of give you a heads up on that. Uh, Jamie said uh, he'll forever give Lou Holtz credit for making Carolina relevant in the SEC prior to his arrival. In the 90s were brutal. And you're right. You know, Coach Holtz, I agree with you. Uh, and it's not a popular opinion with a lot of people. Um, I, there, I think there's a lot of people that just want to, you know, criticize for how it ended. Same thing with Spurrier. I'm like, okay, well, tell, I tell you what, without, those, without Lou Holtz, Steve Spurrier wasn't going to be here. And uh, without Lou Holtz, those back-to-back -back Ohio State um, victories and back-to-back -back seasons didn't happen. And the Quincy Carter five interceptions weren't going to happen. And the Eric Kimry, the fade, wasn't going to happen. Um, you know, so, you know, the 2010 SEC Eastern Division Championship wasn't going to happen. Yeah, I, 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 it, it always sucks how things end, but very rarely do things end well. You know, I have zero issues with going back and appreciating what people did while they were here. Yeah. I mean, and, and you can't speak enough about relevance when it comes to college football because it's. I mean, I think you're still seeing the fruits of the the those seeds planted from the Holtz era, the Spurrier era. I mean, you know, because it is. If they're not talking about you nationally, then these big time players who are being courted nationally are not going to even consider you. No, no. Matter of fact, the way that it ended for Coach Holtz. As Steve Spurrier said, perfect timing. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Coaching's all about timing. Well, yeah, just kind of worked out. Just <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I want to be back in the SEC East, and just so happened the Gamecocks had an opening, so here we are. Uh, yeah, and I and I'm with Jamie. Yeah, look, like Carolina was Carolina was a joke in the '90s. I mean, you. Um, I mean, there were some some good moments. Carolina had good players in the '90 on offense. I mean, there was a couple of good defensive guys, like there. But you know, some of our favorite players came out of the '90s. They just didn't have good teams. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'll forever, forever love. Guys like Zola, Zola Davis, Tony Watkins, Brandon Bennett, um, Lee Wiggins. You know, those guys, I mean, watching those dudes play. Yeah, you know, the John Abrahams of the world. Um, Tannehill. Uh, I mean, it was fun to watch those guys play. They were really good. Um, Deuce Staley. And, I mean, there's we can name a ton of them. We can name a ton of them. But they just weren't good teams. Mm-hmm. Just had to make do and do the best they could with what they had. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, let me read a couple more of these, Phil, and then we'll uh, hit one more uh, break here because we got two left, right? That we got to get to. So um, yeah, we got to squeeze two in. Yeah. Bobby said, "Wife said at halftime of the Florida Carolina game, the water broke. She let him finish the game and then head on to the hospital. What a pro!" That <laughs> I which which Florida Carolina game and did we yeah, win? What year was that, Bobby? Yeah. <laughs> because you know if that was like uh, you know if that was like uh, yeah like one of the nineties where where Spurrier was beating us by fifty, I'd be like, let's just go to the hospital, you know? Yeah, right. Um, Craig said I had no idea when the water broke it would be fourteen more hours till the little stinker comes out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For us, it was yeah, long, long time. Uh, Jamie said, the day my godmother died was the day of the fade. She had cancer, but I will forever thank Eric Kimry for making a terrible day, put a smile on my face. Well, that's up. We'll, we'll pass that along to Eric. We need to get him on anyways. See yeah, how he's it would doing. be nice to have him on, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, Eric's so, so great. Uh, we need, we'll, we'll work on getting him on soon. Uh, but I'll tell you what, boy, that would, uh, these guys, they love hearing stuff like that. Uh, the 93 96 teams weren't awful, but couldn't compete against the best. That's, yeah, I mean, they just, just couldn't play yeah. defense. Um, uh, I partied with Hank the night he made the stop. A uh, little, little fact for everybody Hank is the athletics director at uh, St. John's High School on John's Island, right down the street. Oh. So we run into him uh, often. And uh, Tay SC 1969 says both Holtz and Spurrier put the train on the track, but we definitely got both of them in their twilight years they will always be looked at as notre dame florida coaches hoping shane can be carolinas yeah i will look you know shane's only been a head coach one place so he is carolinas there's no doubt as to no matter what happens there i'll 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 say this though steve coach steve spurrier we haven't heard as much from coach holtz over the years um when he stepped away he really kind of stepped away but I know this, he has always been very thankful for his time at Carolina. And it certainly, yeah, they brought him out of retirement. Coach Spurrier does not miss a moment to make sure that he tells everybody. Now, I was the head coach of South Carolina, too, and here's what we did. Um, but uh, he did everything for the first time at Carolina. So, uh, to his credit, if those are the twilight years and you, you know, you win all those games and did all the stuff he did, I don't think anybody would give them back. There's, there's no doubt about that. No. Okay. Uh, Phil, we'll hit a uh, timeout, uh, 1241, and about 20 minutes to go. We'll be right back. If you're in the upstate of South Carolina and are in need of residential real estate services, Cindy Bass, Sear Foss of Caldwell, Banker Kane is for you. Ask her about the village at Creekside, all of her listings in my hometown of Spartanburg, South Carolina, right there on Daniel Morgan Avenue, married to a lifelong Gamecock fan, and many of our listeners have already bought homes from her and been 100% satisfied with the detail and care she uses. Cindy Searfoss, 864-414-5271, Caldwell Banker Kane in the upstate for your real estate needs. Cool Joe here, and when I'm not eating average jambalaya or celebrating endless summer in Destin, I like to eat pimento cheese straight off the bucket. Mmm, and the only pimento cheese I like to eat is from Nana's Porch. It's award-winning, it'll melt in your mouth, it's good on a cracker, It's good in a bowl. It's good on a piece of bread. 
Also, don't forget Nana's Porch has a hell of a food truck. It's award-winning as well, and they're here for all of your catering needs. So get online, nanasporch.com. It's mm-mm good. Coach O, signing off. In the summer, go Tiger. The preferred sign partner of Gamecock Athletics is Signorama Columbia, and they should be yours too. A full-service sign company that handles design, production, install, and service, Signorama Columbia has helped to bring to life the perfect vision for so many all across South Carolina. Owned and operated by proud Gamecock alumni, they can handle all types of signage, including interior and exterior, vehicle graphics, and more. Go to Signorama.com and find the West Columbia location, or call them at 803-407-9284. Bring your brand to life with Signorama Columbia and go game packs. Hey man, are you sick and tired of your business computer guy? Yes, he takes forever to call me back and doesn't always respond to the requests. Yeah, same here. I'm paying him good money. I constantly have issues and I'm worried he's not backing up my network and securing it properly. You know what, Phil? Let's ask Stone Blanton. Hey JC and Phil, if you want a solution to your IT problems, give Heritage Digital a call. Our boy Matt Odom has a low cost, one price solution that will get you running right. Call 843-699-1001 or heritagedigital.com and ask for Matt. He will hook you up today and tell them Stone sent you. This is Fresh and All-American, Nicky Memorial of the Carolina Gamecocks, and you are listening to the show with JC and Phil. Welcome back, everybody, inside the Gamecocks, the show, Cinerama Studios, and ho- uh, presented to you by Express Sunrooms of Columbia. <laughs> Give John and his team a call or shoot him an email, John B at expresssunrooms.com. It's how to get in touch with him, 803-446-4662. We'll also get you in touch with him. And I'm looking at pictures from uh, practice practice field. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I keep looking yeah. at practice pictures well, today. Well, I think, I think one of the, the, the only, I mean, I... I don't really ever look at many of them, but what um, the one picture that stood out to me correlating with some of the news out of practice was that Blake Franks was here today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, watching practice. I he would say that's a good thing. And then we'll leave I, it there. One would assume. I know. Yeah. I mean, because uh, I heard uh, it's interesting. Like all of these recruits are coming down and, and, interacting with the team and and it and it just kind of solidifies i guess their position and and you know kind of foments their inclination to come here i mean you know it's just it's good to see that all these young kids coming in there and seeing how the team operates and figuring out that this is going to be a good place for them and 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 that way they're accustomed to what it is they're about to walk into after their senior year well i've i always think uh Now what here? I got your lawn while I'm delivering bread in '96. What does that mean? What Brian? What are you talking about? Oh, on, Brian's got on. us on while he's delivering bread in '96. Oh, okay. '96, oh, gotcha. mm-hmm. the town. '96. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, okay. All right, I got you. I got you. <laughs> That's got to be a quick, I, uh, quick yeah. delivery spot there, Brian. I, I, was, I was, I was like, <laughs> man, Brian's. Brian must live next door to Latte Lance. I got your lawn while I'm delivering bread in 96. <laughs> you you got our lawn delivering bread back in 96? What does that mean? So sorry about that. Uh, in, the, in the great town of 96, South Carolina. Okay, okay. I, I'm picking up what you put down now. Yeah, I think uh, Shane is – They're boy, I tell you what, man. They're big on making sure when there's kids in town that there's others joining them somehow. You know, I don't know if he'll ever – tell anybody the real secret i i would imagine if i ever actually asked some of the people i know we could probably get an answer on this but yeah i bet you when there's somebody big coming hey man someone to, wants to come to practice okay he's probably quickly on the horn going call this guy and get this guy and tell him to get here quick <laughs> yeah that's right yeah <laughs> i got that, i got i've got their bread in 96 while we're on the lawn <laughs> He's speaking in code. <laughs> so I was like, hold on, I gotta decipher this. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Call that guy and tell him to bring the lawn with the bread. Back in right. <laughs> Sorry, Brian, I'm not making fun of you. I'm making fun of me because I was not following along at all with what you were trying to say there. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my, my deepest apologies. Electric Bikes of Charleston. I will never apologize for being partners with these guys. Dude, I saw a cat yesterday moving on an electric bike on John's Island. I mean, there was there was I was trying to figure out what was going on. <laughs> there was a, it was pretty funny. There was a there was a school bus that had stopped traffic coming in the opposite direction, but it was at a like at a at a corner of another street. And on on that corner, there was a, a house having a pool put in uh, put in. All right. So traffic everywhere stopped. The school bus finally gets going. The cars in front of me are just having none of it. You know, they're they're still in school bus mode. So they're moving at about five miles an hour for, I don't know, probably 30 seconds or so. Well, this guy must have had it kicked all the way into gear, dude. I'm, I'm assuming... <laughs> I'm assuming he bought this thing from Electric Bikes of Charleston, but he went by me quicker than a motorcycle. <laughs> and uh, I thought, whoa, all right. Oh, that's that's one of those electric bikes. And he, I mean, he had a helmet on and everything. I mean, he's been there, done that. So once that bus had turned off, he said, no, I ain't dealing with any of this. And he just moved it right along. So if you want to move right along from the mountains to the beach and anywhere in between, electricbikescharleston.com. Uh, Michelle and her team power our program. Uh, Craig said, uh, Phil, I don't know how you figured that out. I couldn't. Yeah, I, <laughs> well, I didn't either. So I speak Brian. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, Brian, are you from 96? I butchered. Yeah, I, we, we, yeah, I know. Uh, if Brian's from 96, then no, you speak 96 because that's, that's about, that sounds about right. I might. In my previous uh, life, I did a lot of business in 96, so I, I get it. I did get you? It. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. For, well, you know, as compared to the size of 96 and the word a lot, you know, it, it's a sliding scale there. But yeah, yeah, I sure did. Yeah, it's been um, it's been a long time since I've been through there. Just what I don't know, just maybe what, five minutes or so east of uh, beautiful Greenwood, South Carolina, the home of one DJ Swearinger. That's right. That's right. Right outside. Uh, BRC's from 96. Shout out to the 96ers. All, all right. All right. Yeah, man. I love it. Well, if y'all want to get from 96 to Greenwood in a hurry, you need to head to electricbikescharleston.com. You'll be impressive. That's well within that 60 mile range. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can get there and back in no time. You put a little drink holder on it and drink like Brian does while he's delivering bread. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> we got to get our quick final time out of the afternoon. A uh, little nugget on Don Staley to pass along. You might be interested to, to see and hear this. So don't go anywhere in, inside the Gamecocks, the show from the Sinorama Studios. We'll be right back. New year and the days of being back in the pool and boat are quickly approaching. Many of us don't have the time to hit the gym, but Charleston Fitness Equipment can change that for you. Outfit your home with a treadmill, elliptical, or my favorite, a home rower that allows you to row with the pros all over the world. They have free weights, home gyms, flooring, and much more that makes keeping or getting in shape much more convenient. Located in Mount Pleasant, visit charlestonfitnessequipment.com for more. Get in shape like our Gamecocks. Charleston Fitness Equipment, proud partners of Inside the Gamecocks, the show. Are you looking to buy a new home? Kevin O'Connell with Union Home Mortgage is a local mortgage expert and Gamecocks fan servicing North and South Carolina. Whether you're buying a home, building your dream home with new construction, or turning your equity into cash, UHM's world-class service will ensure you find the perfect mortgage to achieve your home ownership goals. Call Kevin at 803-906-0244 or visit UHM.com today. Union Home Mortgage is an equal housing lender. NMLS 2229 LONMLS 1772182. Daddy, I want you to take me to Disney World. The horror. The horror. Calm down, calm down. JC is here. As you all know, folks, the family and I have visited Disney World many times, but it can be overwhelming, especially if it's your first time going to the most magical place on earth. I highly recommend wherethisroadleads.com and my friend Cherie, a certified Disney vacation planner. That's right. The mouse has given her permission to book your family vacation hassle-free. 
you don't know where to go, don't know where to stay, don't know where to eat, don't know what to do, it can be overwhelming. So get on wherethisroadleads.com and schedule your free consultation right now. She can help you out. The prices are very reasonable. You don't pay any extra fees. Uh, in fact, she's much more reasonable maybe than booking it straight through Disney. So for your next Disney vacation, or you know, more likely your first, so you don't panic, go to wherethisroadleads.com and talk to Cherie, certified Disney vacation planner, a partner of Inside the Gamecocks the Show. This is Braylon Wimmer, South Carolina Gamecock Baseball, and you are listening to Inside the Gamecocks, the show. Go Cox! Welcome back, everybody. Inside the Gamecocks, the show. Final segment of the show for a Thursday afternoon. Seven minutes to the top of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a real radio guy You're now. Turning yeah, into a pro, man. I, that's it, man. I know. <laughs> but, uh, the and some of the producers, like I know Jen's been doing some of this on 107.5, but some of them have to. You got to give the weather and the traffic and. Yeah, that's right. I was like, man, when I was in radio, I was like, don't ever ask me to do freaking weather and traffic. I ain't doing all that. <laughs> yeah, you got no. kind of enough to do around here. It looks um, like it's, it's turning into a real Chamber of Commerce day here in Greenville. So uh, the sun is out finally. Beautiful. It's yeah. getting a little firm. That's about as in depth on weather I'm going to get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looking well, to get outside. The the sun's day. out, guns out. That's the weather report from the Low Country. Uh, everybody, get out there and start start cutting your grass. That's right. Um, real quick tonight, uh, seven three matchup, six thirty on TBS. Michigan State, a one and a half point favorite. Over Kansas State, uh, this one here I think is going to be a lot of fun. Eighth seeded Arkansas and fourth seeded UConn at seven fifteen on CBS. It is a dual television night. If you've got two, Phil has none on his back porch. So anybody in the Greenville area willing to donate, hit Phil up at Phil Molinax on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> Nine o'clock on TBS. Florida Atlantic in Tennessee. I, I I just for whatever reason don't care much for Florida Atlantic. Don't care for Tennessee either. But I'm okay with seeing J Josiah James move on because and I do like Rick Barnes. Um, Josiah went to Porter Goud. Once had him on my program in studio. He's an exceptional kid. So um, I don't like Florida Atlantic, but they are 33 and three. And then late tonight, the 3 2, th third seeded Gonzaga, second seeded UCLA West Coast matchup from Vegas. UCLA mm -hmm. is a one and a half point favorite in that game at 9 45 in the Sweet 16. So, Don Staley yesterday, um, Phil, did win once again uh, the U.S. Basketball Writers Association. Coach of the Year Award. Yeah, congrats to um, Coach Dawn. Yeah, it's the second straight year, third time I'm in four years for Dawn winning that. Just a little while ago. Did they ago, award one in the COVID year? I don't know. I don't think so. Well, uh, yeah, I think they did. Surely they could have awarded a coach. I'm sure they did. Yeah. yeah I'll have to. Well, just a little while ago, Seth Davis, if anybody uh, is a Seth Davis fan in basketball, tweeted, quote, if Temple really wants to win basketball games, it should turn the, the men's program. It should turn the keys over to a Philly native who is a proven winner. Her name is Dawn Staley. Easy choice. I know we've heard the rumors over the years would Dawn jump to the NBA. She hasn't. Would Dawn jump at the chance to coach men's basketball in her hometown? I, I don't know. Ooh, who knows? I don't know. It'd be interesting. It would she, be I think, would be successful at any level she chose to coach. Um, but I don't know. I think there's something just about the women that she coaches. It's interesting. I was listening to an interview with Aaliyah Boston on another uh, – podcast yesterday and the way she talks about Dawn and um, just the relatability factor of it. She's not real heavy handed with them, you know, and just kind of finds the way to get the best out of all of her players. So I don't know. She's, she's definitely a, an unmitigated success. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'll say this, you know, Dawn's in her fifties now and 
you know, do you want to keep the train on the tracks or do you really want to go spend four or five years? Uh, although, you know, she loves challenges, but I mean, I don't foresee anything like this happening at all. But, um, but it is interesting that national media, of course, I mean, Don's, I, 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 this reverts back to the conversation that I asked both you and JC last week. Is Don Staley the face of basketball or not? Well, her name seemingly comes up with every damn job in America, whether it's, it's like, the NBA, the men, the women, it doesn't matter. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I, um, and Taylor, you know, or Tay, I, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know if your name's Taylor or not, but Tay SC says Don is all about promoting the women's game for her to switch to the men's game would contradict her, her message. That's an interesting point. You know, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if Don would see it that way or not. Um, I'm not saying I agree or disagree, but that is a very interesting point. Uh, to be made all right um we will be joined tomorrow by Stuart lake i will add this phil i didn't get to it earlier and i meant to and i owe everybody a major apology today is national puppy day oh. i love puppies we all love puppies budweiser screwed everything up when they eliminated their super bowl commercials with puppies and horses i mean yes. come on everybody loves puppies and horses dude put the puppies and the horses back on tv be a man. All right. We all love that. To celebrate National Puppy Day, it is also National Chips and Dip Day. Do you have a favorite chips and dip? Oh, so it was like, that's interesting. Because what, last week? And then now we're going to add dip. Chips and dip to get. Okay, I've got two. My top two. Ruffles and French onion dip. Oh. And uh, tortilla chips with a solid queso. It is so you're right. It's I mean, I love chips. I love chips and dip. I love all dips. I'm a fan of almost all chips. But it is just so hard to beat good salted tortillas. Got yeah. salted with great queso. Yeah. It's, if you bring that to a party, here's a quick Everybody should know this, but if you don't, PSA if you're ever going to a party and you're like, man, I just don't know what to bring. Bring good tortilla chips with salt and good queso. You'll be yeah. a hero. You That's can even right. do what we do from time to time. Buy the good queso at the store. Buy two things of it. Put it in your own bowl and act like you made it. That's right. That's right. We buy the queso cheese here and then mix it with the milk and do it up and make it right. Yeah, it's yeah. oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, and yeah. hey, best French onion dip. Is uh, just uh, a container of sour cream with some Lipton's French onion soup. Let it, yeah. Mix it up. Let it sit for a couple hours. I mean, it's uh, Chef Phil leading us into the weekend. I'm with you. I and I, dude. I I do make a killer cheese dip, especially during football season. I make it every game day, whether we're in Columbia or we're at home. You know, with the sausage and the cheese and the whole nine yards, and everybody. I mean, it's the first thing that goes. So. Yeah. I tell you what, because I screwed this up so bad today, I will put this right here in front of my notes. We will celebrate Chips and Dip Day tomorrow for everybody on our show. And because we have Stuart Lake, we'll make him celebrate it too. We'll put him on the spot. What is Stuart Lake's go-to Chips and Dip? Nice. <laughs> this is going to be, it's going to be, yeah, Tay, it is the weekend. Just ask Latte Lance. He's been celebrating the weekend since Monday. I'm a firm believer of Thursday being the soft start of the weekend. Yeah. yeah. I, st I still have the five points mentality. Dollar beer night at the saloon. The weekend starts. It's, it's right. Thirsty Thursday. There's yeah. a reason why. There's a reason. Don't you have an 8 a.m. class tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> Bird so course. Like, in the words of smoke, we used to have these little clickers smoke. Like, as long as I click it, it'll work. I'm like. Justin, you have to be in the classroom to click it. You can't click it from home. Oh. <laughs> Maybe that's why they said I had 20 absences. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Craig, that's a staple in my house, too. The Rotel with the cheese yeah. and sausage. Oh, yeah, I love that one. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be the uh, it's got to be the um, the queso um, Velveeta, though. It's got to be the queso Velveeta. Oh, I've never done it with the queso Velveeta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the ticket. There's no doubt. All thanks right. to Preston Thorne and Chris Phillips. And as always, thanks to Chef Boy RD, Phil Molinax. He will join us tomorrow with more recipes to improve your Easter holiday. <laughs> 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 All 
I hope nobody loses any money tonight in the Sweet 16. <laughs> One more day without JC. We can all make it, boys and girls. Hang with us. And we're almost there. We're yeah, almost there. We're almost there. From the Sinorama Studios, signing off. We'll see you tomorrow at 11 on Inside the Gamecocks, the show.